welcome one. Welcome all to the politics of cinema. On this show, we believe films are never neutral. There's a political as well as artistic message captured on purpose or on accident sometimes in every film. And we're on the lookout for all of it. My name is Aaron Spears. And my name is Isaac Miller. And this week we are looking at movies uh, from before the Hayes Code uh, became the official law of the land. That is, we are watching pre-code movies from the 30s. Uh, And specifically, we're going to be profiling 1933's Blondie Johnson, starring Joan Blondell. Indeed. The great, the great Joan Blondell. She had quite a year in 1933. Um, She did, I think she actually did like four or five movies, to be honest, but she had hit after hit after hit. So like that was kind of her year. The the very well-known musicals of the time period, she did Gold Diggers of 33, which is a huge hit. And also Footlight Parade with James Cagney. That was uh, also quite a hit. And then her starring vehicle, Blondie Johnson. Although I got to say, it it pisses me off a little bit, the the poster uh, for Blondie Johnson that they have on IMDb. I don't know if it was the official poster for the movie. I think it may have been. Chester Morris, Danny, gets billing above Joan Blondell. Yeah, that's bullshit. What the fuck? Yeah. Who's that dude? Well, granted, her legs kind of steal the show in the poster, but still, his name is above hers, and nobody gives a shit about Danny in this movie. Yeah. I mean... I only find him interesting in relation to how she dominates him. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Should we start off with a little uh, Hayes Code background or a little uh, Joan Blondell background? You know what? Let's start with a little bit of Hayes Code background because, Aaron, what is the Hayes Code? <laughs> and why are we talking about it today? It's it's interesting that um, the more it's like anything you see a blanket statement. There was no code. Is this pre-code cinema late late twenties to like thirty three roughly? There was a code. There still was a code. There. It just wasn't enforced. There were multiple times when the code attempts at code came to be in Hollywood because Hollywood was terrified that there's going to be government intervention, government regulation of the movie industry. So. The pre-code era that we're looking at is basically the the code was ready to be enforced, but then the Great Depression hit and all fucking hell broke loose. And anything you could do to make money was make money. And that's the pretty much the era that we're looking at with with uh, the pre-code cinema. There were some, what did he have? It was a list called the Don'ts and the Be Carefuls, which is, you know, already kind of wishy-washy dialogue, I would say. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can't, uh, you have to be careful how you use the flag, um, how you show arson, can't show scenes of childbirth, uh, can't have illicit traffic and drugs. Um, white slavery was a no-no. The white kind, not just slavery in general. Is is this So this is what was sort of the unwritten rules, or this is what came with the Hays Code? Those were written. It's just that the, the, the Depression kicked in, the stock market crash and the Depression kicked in. So uh, most of those rules went right out the window because the movies that made money violated all those rules. Mm. You know, this is the era, like, um, well, some of the pre-code stuff we were, we, chatted about privately you get uh, the black hat famous boris karloff bella lugosi one that's pre-code you get uh flaying of a human <laughs> at the end of that one that wasn't Which, exactly on the list of no-nos but like it was violence that you weren't supposed to be showing i mean admittedly you know you don't actually see it but that probably would have broken the budget anyway oh, that's um, probably true i mean that whole movie is pretty icky and the whole implications of what's going on it's weird as hell and yeah, yeah. You, you can feel that pre it's that pre-code energy so what, what i love so I, I would say is what's interesting about what we think of as the pre-code is that it actually right. is a period in which the contradictions of capitalism bring more interesting content to the fore through economic crises how do you mean the contradictions just that oh just just the fact that capitalism is crisis prone and the and the great depression actually forced through forced through the necessity of doing the weird shit right right because those were making money and the ones that stuck to the script well also like it wasn't it wasn't rigorously enforced the way that it would be i think at that point too like will hayes was out there and he had his office but uh if i remember correctly at that point in time too you you when you like let's say you're a screenwriter isaac and it's you know 1931 32 midst of the great depression you would go and say, like, here's what my story is. And you'd be like, okay, yeah, well, that sounds good. Or, but don't show that or don't show that. That was all it was. There's no actual edit power to it. The problem that you had as a studio, though, like, let's say we're running, you know, the Politics of Cinema studio in the 1930s, there were state censor boards. 
So the movie that we're watching right now, like we're, you know, if we're looking at, at Blondie Johnson, we may not have seen the actual movie, the way it was shot, edited, put together, final cut based on what, what, what state you were living in because state censor boards, uh, to certain extents had power, uh, had editorial content, either you can't show the movie here, have to cut that part out here. There were really weird rules. Like one state, you couldn't show people smoking one state. You couldn't show a pregnant woman. It was really all over the map. So it was kind of, a uh, kind of a clusterfuck if you're trying to like, you know, running the, uh, the print traffic depot at like Warner brothers or RKO or something. Cause you're getting in these mutilated prints by the time they're done with their run. So who knows mm-hmm. what the audience was actually even seeing in some cases. Well, okay. So that's, that's interesting. So really, I mean, part of it is, is that we aren't really getting a sense of what people are actually seeing because we're seeing these completed prints that make sense. But in fact, who knows? Right. Right. It's kind of a who knows for sure. Um, I think the the most recent stat I had for it is, as far as Blondie Johnson in 33 goes, in 1927, 37 states had over 100 bills uh, dealing with film censorship, film regulation of some sort, let alone what their censor boards were actually doing. Uh, I think a pretty famous example is Chicago itself had a, uh, um, I think it was the chief of police screened all the movies and said what could and couldn't be projected then. Mm. Um, I don't know if anything can match the revolutionary nature of like film or radio and changing people's consciousnesses. But this would be, you know, we're talking about the early 30s. So basically what we're talking about is the internet being about this old and people freaking out about content and trying to censor it. That's actually a, I had not thought about that. That's a really good analogy for it. Yeah. And the cat's out of the bag too, so to speak. I don't know if that's even the right phrase for this, but by 1930, you've got 90 million people a week going to the movies. So the cultural power that the movies already have at that point, as far as large groups of people all experiencing the same story, learning the same cultural myths, you know, that's pretty powerful. By 33, it it, it takes a hit because it's the Great Depression, but it's only down to 60 million, which is not... Not too shabby either way. I mean, it's the birth of like film as the mass medium here. It's just slightly less than the population, the, half the population on a weekly basis. There's literally nothing that matches that today. I don't think even maybe have to look at the numbers for major sporting events, but I don't think there's anything that's at that scale. Well, I think the internet analogies that like I'm sure you know Facebook, social media, whatever have you know people log number of people logging in a day, but it's not a shared story the way that you have with film or shared cultural myths that can be created well the internet is so custom well the internet splinters people right everybody's got their own internet and it's you know it's very very different this is this is you know you don't have choices this this is your shared you know whatever and of course there's hundreds of movies coming out there's a much you know there's a much more varied film world out there oh yeah yeah for sure so you know when i think of these things we were mentioning um we were mentioning the black cat. I think about King Kong and just the violence of King Kong. Uh, you just, I remember watching that after a long time, you know, after I watched a lot more movies in the thirties. So like I saw it when I was a kid and I didn't really get mm-hmm. it. And I'm just like, Oh, Oh my God. Right. Another pre-code horror movie, which I don't think you could have done quite the way you did. Afterwards is my maybe favorite of the MGM original monster cycle, which is the invisible man. James Whale, the great James Whale. Oh, yeah. And I think it's, it's one of um, Claude Rains' first roles, maybe his first role, and it basically totally revised on his voice. The reason you couldn't do this movie is because he murders hundreds of people. <laughs> like, he literally derails a train and you just see, like, oh, Whoop. right. And it's just like that. You're not going to see that in the 40s. Uh-uh. I, you're just not. I mean, he's like a monster. He literally murders just hundreds of people (laughs) and it's 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 pretty great so you know that's sort of uh, you know i mean it's it's your 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 sex and violence quotient maybe by modern standards is not like you know blowing the roof off but um when you're used to movies from the 30s and 40s that are not part of the pre-code era it's shocking oh for sure yeah i think that's one of those you need maybe to watch a few like early 40s horror movies then go back to some of the pre-code and be like, oh, wow. Because what your picture when you think of Golden Age of Hollywood and like uh, those those boring old films, that is not the pre-code. That is not the pre-code era. Yeah. I mean, I I, I, I love Golden Age of Hollywood. Thank you very much. But yes, no, it's, it's definitely, there's a reason why, there's a reason why, for instance, yeah, that early um, 
Universal Monster Cycle, for instance, is what it is. And you wouldn't have been able to do, you wouldn't have been able to do Frankenstein in the way that you, 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 you did probably. Well, you get the recut version. You don't get that original one where he's chucking that little girl into the lake. You mean, yes. You mean where he bodily murders a little girl? Yeah. You, know, yeah. you really can't pull that off. Right. It's yeah. just never going to have that kind of power. It's not, it's not. Or think about like uh, Merrily Go to Hell which is, you know, like a domestic. That was the marriage one, right? Yeah, it's the marriage one. Where okay. literally they're talking about, you know, he's an alcoholic. They break up while being married and start dating other people and just, you know, fucking with each other by dating other people and yeah. saying how this is what modern marriage is. And it's probably a better representation of actually what things were like in the late 20s or early 30s sure. um, by like than anything you're going to see afterwards. And then it ends, spoilers, for a nearly 100-year-old <laughs> 100-year-old movie. <laughs> well, which, mind you, not like one that a lot of people have seen. But I'll just say that. Right. No, so spoilers. But, you know, it they do get back together, which would be your Hayes Code sort of like, or, you know, you know, like that. Except that they do it because, partially because she has a miscarriage, if I remember correctly. I mean, it's like totally, it's, it's a bittersweet, nuanced ending that you yeah. just wouldn't have seen a few years later. And the whole thing just would have been, would have just been impossible. It's kind of amazing. Right. Well, even with the code too, like you could get away with a certain amount as long as, you know, quote unquote, deviant behavior was punished by the end, but you couldn't get away with all of that necessarily. You know what I mean? Like it was still within reason. You have like the gangster movies where like, yeah, the gangsters to die by the end, but you know, that gangster wasn't like, participating in like child sex trafficking or something completely like, Oh my God, no, you just cannot do that. Right. Not that I'm equating, you know, a swinging polyamorous couple to child sex trafficking. That's not what I meant, but you could only push the boundaries so far and then still have retribution by the end. Yes. Um, in some of these. Yeah. The, I was actually thinking too, uh, Fay Ray and, and King Kong at the same time, she was shooting um, almost simultaneously. They even shared some of the same sets with uh, the most dangerous game. Hmm. Uh, the original, the OG Hunt and Humans movie. Actually, there may have, I think there was a silent version. So maybe that's not the OG one that I'm thinking it was. But that one, you see the trophy room. You see floating heads in jars and jars and bodies and the, the human trophies on display there. And actually, that one was cut down a little bit. Because I, I, if I remember correctly, when they did that with preview audiences, people were like, oh, God. So they had to tone down a little bit of the bodies that they had in there. But still, also, you're hunting humans for for sport. And um, there is there is a bit of a uh, bit of killing in that one. I mean, you know, as you do. Yeah. One of the most famous ones. I don't know. My mind is warped with famous ones could be at this point because I've watched so much pre-code stuff. Like, I feel like this is a famous one um, in the film history circles. I read in uh, Babyface with mm-hmm. uh, Barbara Stanwyck, where she literally sleeps her way to the top of the bank through, you know, she attains financial wealth and, uh, uh, you know, affluence just by sleeping her way right to the top of the bank. And there's even an interesting visual metaphor for that, which every time she beds another man at this bank, it's an exterior shot of the bank and it just moves up one floor to see the next window or moves up two floors to see how far up in the bank she has actually slept her way to. All thanks to, um, well, not thanks to, she's prostituted out by her dad in his illegal speakeasy because this is prohibition during the Depression. Wow. Okay. She realizes the power she has as a woman when a uh, regular at the speakeasy who is not having sex with her for money reads her some Nietzsche quotes and then sends her off with a book of, you know, you're a woman, you have the power. Okay. I'm, that was just added to my list right there. That's yeah. incredible. I think, you know, the movie that we're going to talk about is in its own way, just so subversive, if not more. Right, right. I mean, we'll get into that more, but this is something where a woman dominates everyone around her, not really through her sexuality, though she uses that a little bit, but primarily through her, um, you know, through her brains, through her yeah. overwhelm her con skills, her overwhelm, you know, the fact that she's just smarter than all the dudes and the dudes are going to follow her because they're going to make money. Right. Well, also there's the hope of like, I'm going to score someday with her if I just hang out here long enough. Well, that's for one of them, but you know, he's a chump. Right. Well, so I think there's other people along the way that kind of have that that eye out for her. But yeah, it's um, no, I brought up uh, Babyface just because I think it's it's a perfect it's a perfect double feature with Blondie Johnson because it's one who is who has in Babyface she has her own sexual agency and uses that so that she is not 
completely. I should also mention her dad dies when his still blows up at the beginning of the movie. And she's like, I guess I'll go be a stripper now. And then, you know, her, the, the I think it's actually like the cobbler of the town who ta- tells her about Nietzsche and how she has the power and hands her a book of Nietzsche philosophy. And she's off to the big city and makes her fortune. Also, she's not even specifically punished at the end of that one. The, 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 the man that she actually does fall in love with. Um, okay. Yeah. Again, spoilers for almost a hundred year old movies, but she does kind of somewhat forsake wealth be, uh, to be with him after he is um, he's shot. But, it's pretty clear they still have access to money. Like they are not going back to, I think it's actually like a Pittsburgh steel town that she starts off in. Like they're not going back there. So there, there is, there's some, there's still some wealth to it, but it, no, I think it's, I think it's a perfect pairing with, with Blondie Johnson because now you have Joan Blondell who isn't going the, I'm going to use uh, my sexual wilds to, uh, you know, attain uh, money and financial security. I'm just going to use my brain. And she does. So how did this happen? How did this travesty of the Hayes Code actually becoming a thing? Oh, it's one of those, like you said, there were so many bills in in uh, in different state state houses that it was one of those like, okay, something's just got to be done here. Um, It was one of those that finally, finally, finally snapped and it had to come together. You've got the Catholic Legion of Decency. You've also got the organizing power that was active behind getting prohibition passed. And you have a growing fear of the power of movies, I think, as well, too. Um, That comes to fruition a little later. Actually, there's actually a Senate hearing in 1941. So it's a little bit past, you know, um, what we're talking about with Blondie Johnson here. Uh, But the enforcement of the Hayes Code is is one of those. You've got uh, religious groups, you've got civic groups, you've got government groups. And also there was some pretty solid rumors that William Randolph Hearst was going to be calling on the federal government to uh, to do some regulation of the industry. So it's like, okay, fuck it. We, we've got to actually be serious about this now. We've got to get a handle on it. They also kept rebranding the things too. So you had like the Hayes Code, there was the don'ts and be carefuls. The actual thing they ended up doing, there was like the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. I think I have that term right. It's sort of like an industry trade group. I was like, okay, well, we're going to regulate it. Well, in July 34, they established the Production Code Administration. So like I said before, that you'd go to, uh, you know, if you have a script, Isaac, you'd go to Hayes' office and you'd be like, oh, here's the movie I'm talking about. And they'd be like, okay, yeah, sounds good. And then that was about all that there was. But with the establishment of the Production Code Administration, studios had to submit their films for PCA, is what they call it, PCA approval before releasing. So they actually had power to edit in this case. They had power to be like, yeah, yo, this is not going out. But, you know, this podcast, you know, we're not pro censorship by any means. But there's an interesting angle, I think, to look at from from a studio perspective of the of the production code administration, because what I mentioned before were all the different states and all these different rules where if it's going through the production code administration, it would get a seal of approval that you saw right when the movie starts up. Um, that this movie's been approved, sort of the early stages of, um, very, very early stages of the rating system. But it's been approved. You get the seal right at the front of your movie. And then state censor boards can just calm the fuck down because, hey, hey, we've approved it. Uh, Here are the things we will allow, we won't allow. Everything's good. As long as there's the seal, you're good to go. So a lot of the civic groups eased off. A lot of the religious groups eased off. A lot of the state censor boards are like, oh, okay, okay. They've got a handle on this thing. And so it's kind of, I think, an overt, too much of a course correction at first, but they had these attempts before where it would, you know, not really satiate um, the masses, I guess, as it were, that were calling for some sort of censorship. It makes a lot of sense from Hollywood's perspective, right? Like you want you want regulatory regularity because otherwise you have chaos. How can you make these movies? How can you do, you know, just having right. a set, you know, it makes sense. Consistency of the film's content, everything that's going out to the states, all of that. Well, but some of the con- some of the concessions, I guess, that went into the actual Hayes Code, then, um, like no picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it. What the fuck does that mean? That could mean whatever you want it to mean, right? You know, if you had moral standards, you'd know. Well, I guess that's where I fall short. Then one of the ma- one of the main tenets, though, was like ridicule of religion is prohibited. So, okay, there you go. The religious groups that were calling for censorship are probably a little bit happier. Um, sanctity of marriage and the home is to be upheld. It's just those kind of things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's one of those like, what's the what's the, the the pornography case? Like, I know it when I see it. You know, it's one of those things that you could. These are these are vague enough to be applied 
whenever you want to make a big deal of it or, 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 or you know, really force an application of this. But that's not what we have with Blondie Johnson, because luckily that came out right before, well, not right before, it was about a year, maybe a little less than a year. So yeah, I guess kind of right before the code really clapped down on content and films. Well, then should we transition to our feature presentation? I think maybe we should. <laughs> How much do you think is known about the star of Blondie Johnson, Joan Blondell? I don't know very much, honestly. I think she's really amazing in this movie. She's so in charge. She's <laughs> yes. So, she's, so, um, she's so dynamic in control. And it's a really interesting transition because it's a very short movie. It's like, a, like an hour and seven minutes. Mm-hmm. So she's got to do a lot in this. I guess, you know, you, you, you chose the movie for this one. Yes. And I just want to ask, so why this particular one? I mean, it's, it's a great movie, but there's a lot of pre-code movies that could be chosen. That's true. So. Well, one, I have a serious crush on Joan Blondell, so I wanted to uh, feature her. I think this movie subverts all... When you think of like 30s and pre-code, a lot of times there's, there's a ton of great gangster movies from that time period that you could go to. And I think this is one of them, but this so subverts the, the gangster genre, which we'll get into when we talk a bit more specifically about the movie in a second. I am a huge musical fan. And at the time, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was doing um, a history of the Hollywood musical class. And that's when I fell in love with Joan Blondell because I saw her in um, the Gold Diggers series, uh, Footlight Parade, like her musical stuff. I was like, oh, this, this lady is, she can, she can belt out a tune. She can dance. Holy shit. She also really stuck it to some of the early um, code stuff because she had a some some for the time period, you know, racy uh, pinup photos that went around and became hugely popular. And I just kind of like that attitude of like, you know, sticking up the middle finger at the censors. I thought that was kind of fun. But then when I read a little bit about her her biography and and her her backstory, her backstory, she's not a fictional character. Her life, I realized she was also in the film Grease from uh, seventy seven, which is a personal favorite musical of mine, and. Uh, I was like, holy shit, I, she was in that one. Um, and so then I, yeah, so I, I went back through her career and I was looking at some biogra- biographical work. She grew up in a vaudeville family. And the anecdote mm. goes that her cradle was a property trunk because her parents were on the move from place to place doing all their performances. Wow, that's good That's good stuff. And I was like, holy shit, like it's literally, uh, performing is just in her blood. Yeah, it's great. Like it's, you're like, holy cow, all right. Um, so she was performing from a really early age. She entered like beauty pageants. I think she was a, finalist it's i i don't remember the history of beauty pageant sorry but she was a finalist at some point um she was very active in plays um i think she did like journalism in high school a little bit in college she went to like a teacher's university um at one point then she was like i think she was yeah she in college she went to a teacher's university because she was with her mom who was on tour and was like oh i'll uh, i'll go to this uh, uh, state teacher's college i think it was and then she returned to new york city as an adult, when she, I don't think she finished college there and she worked as a fashion model. Oh, actually I wrote it down hand. She works as a, oh, here you go. Uh, first adult job she's got fashion model, a circus hand, a clerk in a store. And then she joined a stock company because she wanted to become an actress and perform on Broadway. And within a year, she's uh, co-starring with James Cagney in Penny Arcade on Broadway in which Al Jolson sees her buys the rights to Penny Arcade, insists that when he sells it to Warner Brothers, these two, meaning James Cagney and Joan Blondell, star in the movie version, which was called something else. I forget the name of that one. But what is a circus hand? Uh, what is a circus hand? Yeah. Uh, more rhetorical, I guess. But I was just like, the the career move that she has here was just, um, I don't know. That was hilarious. Real, I don't know. And that's a real show business. Yeah. You know, she takes the gig she gets, right? Right, right. Uh, so she sticks with um she sticks with uh Cagney or Cagney sticks with her however you want to look at that and she's in Public Enemy what his big breakout one in thirty one and then goes on to Footlight Parade like I mentioned Gold Diggers are thirty three she is the star of a lot of these really famous Busby Berkeley musical numbers that come mm. out of uh, that glut of musicals that came out in the uh, the early thirties but also think about it if it's 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 the Great Depression at this point and. Musicals are one of the, like the most perfect genre for escapist entertainment, and she can sing, and she can dance, and she can she can do it all. She probably juggle too, for all I know. I, I I don't know. Oh, almost almost undoubtedly. Yeah. <laughs> um, with a biography like that, yes, I'm sure she can juggle. 
like it's just lives and breathes showbiz and uh i don't know i respect that that's pretty that's pretty sweet well let's 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 talk a little bit about this movie yeah i'm in this business to get all i can out of it from you or from anybody i know all the answers and i know what it's all about i found out that the only thing worthwhile is dough and i'm gonna get it see i'm gonna get it because we've, we've been saying why she's great and we've been saying why pre-code is interesting right this is this sort of early 30s no man land where like you can pull off a lot of things yeah but you know i find this movie i was just sort of thinking about the beginning i mean like basically you know blondie johnson the basic you know the basic synopsis is that she's she's a woman whose family has all died like we see her mother die at the beginning they've been evicted from their home because she's jobless and the whole system basically says you should go get a job you know how dare you and this is something that really struck me as an interesting thing for modern sensibilities so she's part of the reason that they're homeless or they're living with neighbors or whatever or they're living in the back of a shop they're uh, living in the back friendly of a shop. neighborhood they're, shopkeeper that they've known is like yeah you can crash here for a minute is she quit her job and it's why she can't get on the dole it's why she basically can't get like that period's sort of version of welfare but why did she quit it sounds like basically sexual harassment yeah her boss is a pervert yeah her boss is a pervert yeah and she quits but that's not good enough Right. Right. You know, if you quit, you can't get this. When she's at the welfare office, like the guy actually says, she's like, he's like, oh, you can't find work. She's like, well, I had this job. And he's like, what happened? She's like, I quit. And he's like, wait, wait, you quit? All right, get out of line. I can't help you. Right. But it's specifically the sexism combined with work life. Yeah. And then a system which is utterly callous and absurd. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, multiple family members who died due to lack of care. And she basically says, screw it. I'm going to take everything, the world for all of its worth. And she starts conning. Yeah. And she basically, because she's smarter than everyone else, and as she sort of works her way within, within you know, a group of uh, gangsters in the big city yep. and works her way to the, and works her way to the top, it's because she's, she's just, she just dominates any room that she's in. She dominates the space. She's smarter than anyone she deals with. And it's, um, it's it's just sort of something to watch, right? Like it it's Oh, for sure. Well, I before you go too far, I want to highlight how bleak. And I know we just covered the great silence. We've talked about bleak <laughs> bleak cinema <laughs> recently, but how bleak the opening is. The welfare office that she's trying to go and get some, you know, some social services, some welfare here. It's the fucking depression is packed. It's pouring rain outside. She's uh it's a slow pan up her intro cuz like in the classic Hollywood stuff you got to watch how the stars are intro. Like they have an intro shot, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. it pans like up her legs. You see the torn stockings. She's trying to hold it together, but she can't get, uh, can't get, can't get, uh, can't get welfare there. She mentions that her mom has scrubbed floors, but she's got like pneumonia or she's sick right now. Like you said, she, she returns to the shop after not getting on, uh, not being able to get any help from the state. She returns to the shop because her mother and her mother has died. She makes a mention though, that, her mother scrubbed floors and her kid's sister got into trouble, couldn't afford a doctor, and then she died, which sounds like a back alley abortion to me from the 30s, right? I didn't even think of that, but yes, you're totally right. Yeah. This is bleak. Um, yeah. A back, alley ab a back alley abortion, sexual mistreatment on the job. And then she's being harassed too, presumably her sister as well. And so at that point, she's just like, this city is going to give me a good living. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what I, what I need. And she even has a part where she mentions there's two ways of getting that, the hard way and the easy way, the easy way implying prostitution. Right. And the hard way meaning, I'm just smart, everybody. I'm just going to take this town for all I can get. Well, I, th I thought the hard way would be like honest work. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah. I mean, part of it is, you know, the, the next thing she actually goes through, well, you know, the doctor who's with her, with her mother says, oh, you should, you should sue. And literally the lawyer just like, well, you don't have the money for this. You either have the money or you don't have the money. Right, right, right. And, you know, go get a job. And it's like, yeah. that's horseshit. I already did that. So what does yeah. she do? <laughs> she goes and she dominates. Yeah. She takes the grift to the city. Yeah. There, well, part of what is also really fascinating to me about this is I was, I was trying to think of modern films that kind of tell similar stories, female gangster stories. This is what this is. It's a female gangster story. 
she has, you know, people killed. <laughs> like, uh, she's a badass gangster who's running the city. And I was thinking you've got like hustlers. Uh, the kitchen wasn't as big, I guess, you know, a few years ago. Um, Elizabeth Moss, Tiffany Haddish, and uh, Melissa McCarthy, I believe. And then you have widows. These are all like females who step into the quote unquote, you know, classic male role of gangsters in, in movies here. All of those movies, though, make a big deal about how we're women in a man's world. And I'm not saying that shouldn't be a plot point, but that's a that's a serious plot point in all of those movies. This movie never even once mentions like, but you're a woman. You can't be a gangster or but you're a woman. Why should I listen to you? She's just one of the gangsters. I mean, I think, you know, the gender dynamic is there. You can see it. And one but it's of not a things, plot point. It's not a, but it's, a but key it's not to actually. It. It's yeah. not really a plot point or a key to anything. It's just that she is a woman, and so she's treated as a woman. But once it's clear what she can do for them, uh, gangster various gangsters start circling around her. I think it might be worth interest uh, talking about her love interest in this movie. Oh yes, <laughs> uh, or Chester Morris, Danny. Yeah, you know, part of it is you know she starts grift by grifting him on the street. He by chance runs into her, realizes it's a grift, tries to get her to do a plan of his to get one of their uh, associates out of jail. And she says, I've got a better idea. Like he wants her to like get blackmail material on the judge. And she's like, right. I've got be something <laughs> better. You know, we're going to win over the jury. And she has it though, with the sense of like, Oh, that's cute. You had a plan. Anyway, we're going to do this. Right. Their relationship is really, I think is really interesting because it's clear that she's into him. She's the dominant partner throughout and she uses feminizing language with him. She tells mm -hmm. him at one point that he's dolled up. Yeah. And you know, it's like very clear with it. And he desperately wants to be with her and she wants to be with him, but it's like, no business is business. I look at everybody else. Their relationships are slowing them down and I'm not doing that. I think, you know, that dynamic is really interesting. It is because she, she almost even says it uh, almost in this specific way of like, well, first we got to do business. Like I need money once this is taken care of. I don't know what like the end goal or amount is, but it's, she's never like, oh, I don't want you. I'm not interested. You know, it's, it's always like kind of, I guess you could say stringing them along, but like, it's, it's almost like, no, 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 not right now. This is not the time for that. I got, I got this gangster shit to do. Yeah. And well, I mean, part of it is this, this is someone who she's at a certain level, you could read it as she's afraid to be vulnerable. Right. But the yeah. other level is, you know, and you could certainly say that, but the other level is literally being in a relationship with you will get in the way right. of, and it's our grift <laughs> of our grift. Um, will will distract us. We'll distract both of us. His boss doesn't, doesn't like her, thinks this is dangerous, tries to rub him out. But the other gangsters that have sort of rallied to her and her planning for them, I mean, we're not going into details of all this stuff because you can just watch the movie. It's not long. Yeah. But like, you know, that have rallied her, rub out the head boss basically for her and, and for, for Danny to a certain degree. They put Danny as the figurehead of their operation. And when Danny steps out of line and tries to get rid of her, she, they, it's very clear who they stand with and it's not the guy. Right. And they, they just push him aside just like that. It's really awesome. <laughs> it's great. It's really, and it's, it's, I think it's done with more emotional nuance and sort of care than you would expect. Well, also that you would think you'd get in a hour or seven minute movie, like this thing moves, but it does take the time to establish really endearing characters that you um you're you're rooting for which is weird because like danny to me for like a good 35 maybe 40 minutes of the movie i'm just like whatever <laughs> um i I'm, I'm just not really invested but it actually does turn like you said once once he's ousted as the figurehead and blondie's actually sitting in the office she's uh you know calling the shots and she realizes oh shit i'm gonna have to take out danny because he's gonna rat us out to the cops there is a turning point where I was just like, I realized, oh, I, I, no, I kind of want them to have a happy ending. Well, it's, it's that we actually, despite the fact that he's, because he's lame, right? Right, right, right. We're, this is the thing is this, we are used to 
part of your Hayes codism, right, or part of the broader thing is that the man has to be dominant because it's kind of terrifying in a patriarchal society to have a woman who's like this, who is powerful, right. for whom the men are subordinate to them by their sheer intelligence, right? Yeah. Not It's not her feminine wiles, really. It's that her schemes are better. Right. And that she's a center of money that none of the other ones can do without her. She's smarter. She's just smarter. And so part of it is is that, yeah, he's he'll never be able to keep up with her, right? And it's it's very clear at the beginning. I mean, she belittles his intelligence throughout. <laughs> she really does. But because it's got the, like those classic zingers um, going throughout the whole movie where it's just like, oh, my God, what a put down. Oh, what a put down. Um, it's, oh, it's, it's great, great script. Um, but part of it is, is like she realizes, well, she's in, misinformed that he's going to betray them. Now, he, you know, he's like he's been stripped of all of his resources and everything. And then it turns out that, no, he wasn't going to betray them. And she realizes that she loves him and they all get caught and they all go to jail. But he goes for less. And they get, you know, they're going to get together in the end. And he, in a certain sense, so this is, I want to ask if this works for you. Yeah. Because in a certain sense, he was right. Because earlier on in the movie, he's saying, life is short, so we should actually have fun on the way. Right. And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the end of the movie, she realizes that, you know, the path that she'd taken was going to burn out and you'd be left with nothing in the mm-hmm. end. So might as well have Danny, this dope who I can outsmart any day of the week. <laughs> and that is, to me, a very Hayes Code ending. And it's, or it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's the, it's the proper comeuppance. Um, does that annoy you? Does it work? Oh yeah, no, not really. Um, it, it, it's a little unsatisfying because even at the end, yeah, like they're they go into court, they're being hauled away in handcuffs, they're they're getting their sentences. And he's like, well, I'll see you in a few years. Like, no, that's, that's years. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, you're going to come out just as poor as you were when the movie started here. Right. But, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if that was like a script decision because, you know, you know, this is following Public Enemy and some other pre-code gangster movies where like, yeah, I mean, it, they don't go out in a hail of bullets. So I don't know. I yeah, I guess that's the question. Which, which, which gangster ending do you want? Do you want them where like they're going to go away for a little while and maybe get together when they get out of jail or do you want them going out in a hail of bullets together? Like, uh, you know, future Bonnie and Clyde style. I want neither. Uh, I want the, they just cold... get away with it. I mean, listeners to this podcast will know that I like my noir ish cold, hard contradictions. It's true. Which I honestly, I think have come out in both of our last two movies. I think my motto keeps to be, it keeps ends up, being you know like this is how you deal with hard choices through film it's like that's like three films out of the last three so okay maybe i should just not have that happen in this one but the fact that yeah you know he she doesn't get him killed he's just injured no he should die and it was what was necessary and she ends up being haunted i i want a godfather ending to this yeah you're right and danny is uh, fredo yeah that's a better ending that's true. But I'll take it because you know what? They've got some chemistry. Yeah. And like you said, <laughs> like we sort of got, well, that's just it. When that happens, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. When she ends up having to double cross him after, he, you know, after he attempted to double cross her and then she just yeah. easily kicked him out of the business. Um, I, I really, uh, I I felt it right, like I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. I'm just like, oh no, this right. is this is horrible. Like you haven't heard anybody who didn't deserve it. And it's like he kind of does, but you're right. I think I think that's a turning point because up till then he's just like he's been kicked out, and then they're like, oh well, he's definitely the one who went to the cops and ratted us out. Well, we got off this guy, and then you realize she gets the information after the hits already been called out on him that oh no, actually it wasn't him. He held strong. Mm-hmm. I think like the lawyer mentions that he's like, no, no, Danny, he's a stand-up guy. He's he or you know he he stayed with you, and she's like, oh crap! So she has to race to uh to stop the killing, which she's too late to get shot. But also like you got some shitty contract killers because like they just shot this guy and left him not dead on his apartment floor. Um, this is not that hard, <laughs> folks. <laughs> You're right. The ending should have been uh that should have been the ending. I I, I do want to back up for just a minute because I want to I, I think one thing that really highlights her intelligence but also the intelligence of this screenplay is 
one of the cons. So like there's all these little cons that she does. Like as soon as she gets to the city, uh, Red, um, the the cabbie that she's in, she cons him real quick. And he's like, all right. And she's like, wait, you know, I'm going to bring you in on this. Like you and I can work together as a cabbie and we can con some people out of, you know, fairs. And that's how she meets the whole crew that she ends up, right, you know, being in charge of anyway. But in the middle of the movie, there's a con that she runs between a jewelry store and a bank mm-hmm. and a hairdresser's that is pretty spectacular because there's certain ways you can do con artist plots in films. One is to let the audience know exactly what the plan is. And then we watch the plan play out and we know, oh, they hit a bump here. Oh, this is going wrong here. And another way you can do that is to let us know maybe like the kernel of the idea. And then we'll see how mm-hmm. it plays out as the movie goes on. In this one, she's just like, Hey, I got a plan. Cut to the next scene. The plan's going. You're like, what, 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 what are they doing here? And you're watching it play out, knowing that they're con artists and they're up to something, but you don't really know what the con is that's going on. And it's a really captivating, probably like 10, 15 minutes of the film here, where it's like a combination of like bad checks at a bank, getting jewelry from a jewelry store, offing it real quick at a beauty salon. And it just really shows that like her mind for kind of how society and specifically a few specific businesses work means she can uh con people out of money but what she's really doing in the long run is conning the jewelry store owner into buying gangster insurance from them right that's their action that's the racket that's the business so like, they put together yeah like it's like this long con to get there but they also make a little dough on the way to that long con it's like holy shit like it's a you you need that in the movie you need that in the plot because as soon as you see that completion arc to that con you're like god damn this this okay this woman knows what she's doing like this is a smart gangster she is going plays like okay yeah she's she's the real deal here i just want to highlight her interactions early on with the cab driver right who sure. only shows up again at the end she he sort of introduces her into the world and then so red she start red yeah. she starts out by conning red doing a simple con on him and then him pointing out that he'd conned her through the the ride right like the the he basically um had her go on a longer trip than needed to right from like the train station to where she was going was like across the block and he took her like all around town and i love their interactions because they don't waste any time with either of them being offended by this right <laughs> they're both just like oh that's pretty good oh that's pretty good that's pretty good i'll make you some money kid all right let's do this let's do like it, it yeah <laughs> and it's 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 you know it's 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 con knows con but it's also just yeah like it doesn't there's no fat in those scenes it's just good chemistry yeah 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 and you know there's no they don't waste any t- emotional time on something that you don't really need right side note it's interesting this is the gang is actually kind of multiracial because one of her female henchmen her friends is um oh lulu yeah, is 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 Asian American Toshia uh, Mora, Mori, Toshia Mori. Mori. And this is just a side thing, but you know, in a mid thirties movie, you don't see that very often. Where it's not remarked upon, it's not like part of her background. There's no stereotypes or anything. She's just a character, right? Absolutely. I think that lends itself also to that conversation we having earlier about how like it's not a big deal. Like, hey, there's a woman gangster leading our gang. What is what is this here? Like, it's just. These are just uh, the right people for the right jobs, and they're here for the con, which is also refreshing because she was uh, uh, her main her main roles in in, in Hollywood were, were Charlie Chan movies. So it's nice to see her playing um, an actual just like character. Yeah, exactly. Like she's just a regular character, not a big yeah. not a big role, but she's in there and she's part of the cons. And you know, well, there's actually even an, a. A mention, I think, because once you're in um, where or Blondie's like penthouse apartment that that she's at, uh, Lulu, I think, is like dressed uh, like as a as a as a maid, right? And they make a they make a real brief comment about how like, well, you know, you got to play the part or something. Like it's right. they acknowledged like, and that's what people expect, so they don't you know they don't look twice when I'm wearing a maid outfit, right? Well, she can't do the other role because the other role is acting as Blondie's mother, right? Yeah, that's not going to work. And so it's, a, yeah, no, it, I mean, yeah, I guess that is one sort of acknowledgement of, of sort of race, but it's, it's very casual. I like that one of her girlfriends in this basically, and this is sort of your pre-code of it. It basically says you should, you should give Danny a tumble. Like, oh, that's right. She not, does. <laughs> yeah. Just why not just do it? Well, you know, why not just fuck him? Just yeah. do it. You know, you want to. Like, why not? And, you know, she gives the same ex- explanation she gave to Danny. But it's just the casualness of that. 
right. is this feels more real, right? I mean, that's right, the right, thing right. about this is the thing about pre code movies is people, and this is not I I love my post code movies, right? And I love the things that you do, and I but they people do feel a little are allowed to be a little more actual human beings, yeah. In a way, I think the last time we mentioned code stuff was once again during the summer of the '60s. Check it out. But I think the last time we actually brought this up might have been when we talked about who's afraid of Virginia Woolf because we were we were comparing the period of sort of the crumbling of old Hollywood in the late '60s to uh, the pre-code era. Oh yeah, yeah. I was wondering where you're going with that connection. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's definitely there because once again, like with who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, suddenly people are allowed to act a little bit more like people yeah 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 and in a sense they're you know not to that degree but you feel it in both films yeah 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 well i was thinking also that aside we're like why don't you give you know danny a tumble um it's also acknowledging that like okay well there's something here like other people see that they click sure yeah so i mean it is it, it does make it feel a bit more real, but also I, I, it does serve, not that it always has to, but like, but it serves, because this is so compact. It does serve a quick narrative purpose to like, oh yeah, when they get together, this is going to make sense. This isn't really like a major point, but I did want to note that there's once she first went, when she wins that courts, that court case for the, the, the group of gangsters and they're celebrating, there's a scene afterwards where she is, um, she switches to wearing pants. It's when Danny goes and he thinks he's going to hook up with Blondie because they just celebrated. They're at the party. They're out. The guy got the guy, got his buddy out of jail. And um, she's there wearing like a full like pantsuit kind of kind of ensemble. Um, Did you notice in this movie that uh, there's chop suey restaurants? Yeah. I don't know what it is in the 30s. There's several times in these pre-code movies where they're like, let's go out for chop suey or they're just out for a walk. And there's a chop. Was that just like a restaurant fad in the 30s? Uh, Is this like. Yeah, maybe I, you know, I, I, this now makes me want to look up the history of American Chinese food and what phase this was in. Like it, it seems, yeah, like yeah. there's a fad going on here because I don't That's know really when, weird. you know, American Chinese food has a particular history, right? It's not Chinese food. And well, right. And I think, you know, it's a pretty complicated commercial history with a certain degree of monopolization and so forth. And I, yeah, now it makes me want to look up like what is going on and why is this sort of the reference point for everybody? Yeah. <laughs> well, that is a quick primer of some pre-code, pre-code chat, some pre-code chatter, and also some focus on Blondie Johnson featuring the spectacular Joan Blondell. Um, I think for our up next, we've got to check in with our watch challenge to uh, see how that went for the last month running a little uh running a touch behind um on that but we'll be getting caught up here caught up here shortly i believe yeah you know uh life has intervened a little bit i think both of us have had things have been a little bit crazy but yeah no we're we're gonna we're gonna try to get back on track but before we sign off we like to give out a friendly reminder to be sure and rate and review the show and whatever podcast app you're using if you enjoy the show tell a friend or two or three or five we are also up and running on Twitter and Instagram and the usual uh, social media platforms. So give us a follow. The links are in the show notes to the various socials. And until next time, I am Aaron. And I'm Isaac. And stay safe out there. And especially, you know, don't cross Blondie Johnson because she'll wipe you the <laughs> fuck out. Like, you don't, you don't stand a chance. That's a good way to stay safe. Just don't bother.